busy schedule, so we appreciate you taking the afternoon to join us today. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the New America Foundation, we're a national, nonprofit, nonpartisan policy institute. We're based in Sacramento and in Washington, D.C. And, um, and this year, uh, because of the passage of the Affordable Care Act, uh, and, uh, and the various provisions in the act that we believe help to financially empower Californians by providing millions of uninsured residents with health insurance, but also key provisions within the CARE Act itself that, uh, that help to eliminate disincentives and silly rules that keep families from savings. Our asset building program and our health program partner together through research and policy development uh, and legislative advocacy to advance a health wealth agenda that we'll be talking about in detail uh, this afternoon. Uh, but, uh, but in our asset building program, we traditionally advance assets in all policies, in the area of banking, in the area of taxation, in the area of education, and in the area of health now um, this year. And, uh, and we're, we, uh, we decided, um, because of the, uh, of the release of a report on medical debt that, um, that our partners at the Access Project, Mark Rukavina, who's traveled all the way to Boston to be here with us today, um, in partnership with Lee Hawsey and our health program, co-wrote, thought that it would be a brilliant opportunity to go on the road and basically take Sacramento out of the bubble that Sacramento is and, uh, and travel to Los Angeles, Fresno, and Oakland and have this conversation um, with real people that get it <laughs> and uh, that want to know about the various policies that are moving forward in Sacramento. Um, because uh, when it comes to, for example, legislation, uh, session ended um, in the beginning of September, and the governor has up until October the 9th to sign many of these bills into law. And so it would be an opportunity for all of you also to hear about what could potentially become law um, and will impact to all folks we care about in the beginning of 2012. Um, and so with that, I just want to thank our partners, uh, the Urban uh, Strategies Council and Alameda County Department of Public Health for joining us to convene this health wealth conversation and specifically explore the areas of medical debt and how medical debt impacts Californians' ability to build savings uh, and, uh, and be financially secure. So I'm going to introduce Lisa Forty from the Urban uh, Strategies Council, who I'm sure all of you in the room know. Uh, she's an incredible leader in this space and in this field. And actually, it was about a year ago that she invited us to join her at the California Endowment uh, to, uh, to be a part of this conversation and just want to build on this discussion. And that's where I actually met Mark Rukavina. So these convenings do help to create these synergistic opportunities. So with that, thank you so much, and let's get started. Lisa? Thank you, Olivia. Um, as Olivia said, I'm Lisa Forty. I'm with the Urban Strategies Council here in Oakland, and I uh, staff the Alameda County Community Asset Network of collaboratives. Some of our members are here today. We've been working together since 2007 on income and asset building strategies in the county and regionally, and we're really proud to co-host this conversation, um, and also really proud that one of our founding member organizations, the Fremont Family Resource Center, um, Arnie Becker, is on the panel today to talk about who what he sees on the ground with the families that he serves, because we think that that local perspective is really important as a part of these policy conversations. Um, we've been really interested in the connection between health and wealth, and as such, we were one of the co-founders of the Health Wealth Connection Collaborative with the Public Health Department and some other partners. Um, and last year, as Olivia mentioned, we hosted um, this Health Wealth Symposium, really trying to bring together the fields of economic, and justice, economic justice and public health, because we know how close health equity and income and asset building and wealth opportunities and communities are. We're still continuing those conversations. We're still strategizing and working together locally. Um, and there's a lot of exciting projects that are being incubated. So if anyone's interested in getting involved in what's happening locally around the Health Wealth Connection, please come and see me. I'd be happy to talk to you um, after the panel. Now, I had the honor of presenting a very close partner. Um, Anita Siegel is the director of the Alameda County Public Health Department. And I can honestly say that the, um, we are so lucky in this county because we have a national leader in terms of the health wealth connection in our public health department. They get it. They understand that economic justice and public health are so closely correlated and linked, and they don't just understand it, they're acting on it. They're looking at income protection strategies. They're looking at how foreclosure and health are linked. They're looking at how the well-being of communities has all these other social factors and what they as a health department can do about it. Um, so she has a brilliant staff that I'm privileged to work with. She's um, an amazingly energetic and committed uh, partner in this, in this conversation, and I'm just really pleased that we have this helpful partnership locally. So I wanted to introduce um, and just
say that to my mother. <laughs> so I'm Anita Sigo. I uh, have the privilege of being the director of Alameda County Public Health Department. And uh, we are a very progressive department that's looking at uh, the determinants of health and working uh, very hard at it. Um, so with our partners, the New America Foundation, with Urban Strategies, and the Select Committee on Financial Empowerment, um, I want to welcome everyone to today's conversation. And as I look over uh, the audience and see the partners that are here, I know that we have an opportunity for a great conversation around uh, medical debt. So we're here in support of uh, the New America Foundation and their solutions-based report on uh, medical debt, an issue which has profound health consequences. And I want to uh, tell a little story about myself. Um, unfortunately, over the last two years, uh, my husband and I have had to deal with the medical uh, world. Uh, we're dealing with a, a medical, a chronic medical problem. And um, I am so blessed to have uh, full uh, coverage uh, through my work because when I look at the bills for every single treatment that my husband is going through, it's astounding. And I know that if we had to pay a portion of it, uh, we probably would not be, we, we wouldn't have a house, we'd probably be renting at this point. And I know that a lot of Americans, because of medical debt, either lose their home or actually go into bankruptcy. And that is, that is so sad in this country. Um, so every day my husband and I are blessed, and uh, we, we, we thank, uh, we give thanks for that blessing of having great medical coverage. So we're here to discuss medical debt and its implications on financial stability and the larger context of health and wealth. And we know that health is very tied to, uh, to wealth. And, and we know that in this county, in this community, that there are great disparities, that there are communities where um, people don't live as long as they, they should, uh, infants don't celebrate their first birthday, uh, schools aren't aren't as good in, in some of our neighborhoods, and it's all tied to wealth. Um, so wealth determines whether we live in a safe neighborhood, whether the home we live in has uh, good air to breathe, whether there's fresh uh, fruits and vegetables in our neighborhood, and whether or not we can take a child um, to the doctor when we get sick. Um, so regardless of income, debt deducts from wealth, and wealth seriously impacts health. Medical debt may lead to short-term trade-offs, preventing people from seeking much-needed care. Uh, medical debt also impacts the ability of families to accumulate wealth. We know that this has profound effects on how well children do in our community. Even with the passing of the Affordable Care Act, rising health care costs and inadequate coverage continue to have a profound impact on some of our most vulnerable populations. And I know I have, we're, my husband and I are living through this, and like I said, we are so thankful that we have great health coverage. Um, the health implications of wealth are the same as lacking income. We know that right now in this country, we have a 12% um, unemployment rate. Nationally, African Americans have an unemployment rate of almost 18%. Um, in Alameda County, the unemployment rate among African Americans is 20%. And we know that this greatly affects um, our income and our ability to accumulate wealth. And medical debt threatens to reinforce this widening gap in inequalities among racial lives. So in Alameda County, like um, Lisa said before, we are working in partnership with the community to try and bring health equity to all the residents of Alameda County. And health equity implies that there is equity in education, equity in health, edu uh, equity in the way we live. And to achieve our, our mission, um, we have to look at all of these uh, broader issues, access to power, resources, and opportunities. We are well acquainted uh, with the compounding effects of economic stability on health, opportunities to accumulate sa savings, acquire credit, develop assets um, that are not equitably distributed. In Alameda County, where we uh, experience significant disparities in wealth along racial and ethnic lines, r rising medical costs and loss of income threaten to perpetuate health inequity. In our most recent health equity report, we found that Af African American citizens living in Alameda County were three times more likely to be living in poverty than a white resident. The work that we're doing and the partners that uh, we're partnering with 
um, include um, urban strategies, um, East Oakland building healthy communities, building blocks, and place matters. And all of these uh, different partners are helping us to work on uh, the social determinants of health and also um, wealth issues. Um, so with the New America Foundation has been a champion for increasing the income and assets for Californians who suffer disproportionately from the worst health outcomes. And we are so, so grateful to have such an amazing partner. Um, so we're, we're proud to be promoting this. Um, so at this point, I've said enough, and it's my pleasure to introduce my friend and my colleague, a real leader in public health, and the vice president um, for Public Health Institute, Carmen Navarez. Good evening, everybody. The, uh, the format that we're going to use today is I'm going to do a very brief introduction, and then each of our speakers will come up one after another and share their, uh, their, their, their ideas, their presentations with you. I want you to think of the questions that you think are particularly good, and at the end we'll start to have a conversation and see if we can if we can carry ourselves to about 1:30, and um, we can stay a little bit longer if we need to. But let's, let's try to sort of shoot for that time, okay? Um, well, we all know that healthcare expenditures exceed 16 percent of our gross national product, but we don't really know enough about the other impacts of our nation's generally poor health status. As we think about medical debt, healthcare expenditures, and how to turn this massive ship around, I want to remind everybody that probably 85% of the things that cause poor health in this country are preventable. A lot of you guys are working on this stuff. You're working on everything from changing where the roads go and changing the quality of housing that people have and changing the level of education that people can access. But we have a long way to go. And until we actually make it somewhere in, in preventing ill health, I'd like to start this conversation on one of the very important sequela of poor health, and that's what poor health does to our pocketbooks and to the economy in this country. So let me introduce you to this amazing group of people. We're going to start with Mark Lucavina, who's the executive director of the Access Project whose efforts provide local initiatives with research and policy assistance. He's a nationally recognized expert on issues related to health access and medical debt, especially as they pertain to low and moderate income Americans. And after Mark, we'll have Leif Wellington Haas, who's the California-based senior fellow in the health policy program of the New American Foundation. He is a leading author and researcher on US healthcare system reform insurance coverage, and controlling health care costs. After Leif will be Olivia Calderon, who is the California Legislative Director for the New America Foundation. She's based in Sacramento and helps policymakers to really hammer out the laws that improve the welfare of its residents. Finally, we'll end with Arnie Becker, who has a very, very interesting background in that he served as a photojournalist. So he looks deeply at things <laughs> and tries to convey what they mean to people in a way that's different than most of us do in our daily work. He is uh, serving as a volunteer at Lifelong Medical Clinic in Berkeley and East Oakland, the Charlotte Maxwell Complementary Cancer Clinic in Oakland, and has been both a paid and, fin and volunteer financial counselor at Fremont Family Resource Center and is a volunteer income tax assistance program with instructor in Coach Alameda County. Now that is a truly diverse and well, well distributed in terms of talents uh, panel. Let me call Mark up to start with his presentation.
Good afternoon. Thank you um, for the introduction. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today. I want to thank the New America Foundation and Lisa and folks at Urban Strategies and all of you who are part of this health wealth work. And it's such a pleasure to be here in California among the, and, uh, some of the most forward thinking and progressive um, forces across the entire country. I'm wondering if we can just have a show of hands here. I'm trying to understand who's in the room. And I know it's arbitrary to ask whether you work on health-related issues or asset and wealth issues, but you can just bear with me and um, simply kind of view. Um, how many of you are public health or healthcare people? How many of you do work around economic justice issues or asset building issues? Others? <laughs> Okay, thanks. Um, I'm just going to give up a, a um, there, there's slides in the, in the packet that you can see. Uh, my presentation will be uh, hopefully brief, under 10 minutes. We, we did a presentation yesterday in LA and all of us were convinced that when we, each of us got to our six minute mark, there was something wrong with the time. <laughs> uh, but I'll, I'll give kind of a, a broad overview of, of healthcare costs talk about uh, some of the medical debt data that's already been mentioned, explore a little bit this health, uh, the health wealth connection, and talk about some opportunities for mitigating medical health in this new policy environment. Um, health expenditures, two and a half trillion dollars in, in 2009, actually a little more than 16%, 17.6% of the gross domestic product. Um, with that amount of money spent, still 49 million people uninsured. Last year, 2010, new census data came out recently, increasing the number of uninsured from 49 to 40, uh, nearly a million additional uninsured. Um, fortunately, for about a million young adults, they had uh, coverage. They were able to buy, be covered under uh, their family health plans. And um, otherwise, that number would have been even greater. Uh, but uh, the number I want to call your attention to is the projected cost of health care is going to go from two and a half trillion dollars or slightly more than that today to more than four and a half trillion dollars. Uh, nearly 20% of the gross domestic product. So clearly um, work needs to be done around health care affordability. And I want to congratulate Carmen and folks in California broadly and the Public Health Institute for the award that you received the community transformation grants, because I think that is uh, going to be necessary work to try and do something about uh, health care costs and really try to bend this cost. <coughs> so congratulations. On it. So a little bit on um, unaffordable health care costs, and these data are from the Commonwealth Fund. Um, about 73 million Americans had troubles paying medical bills in 2010. And those were uh, people who said that they were unable to pay bills, struggling to pay bills, the contract by a collection agency for unpaid medical bills, had to change their way of life, or had medical bills that they, medical bills that they were paying off over time, or people who had incurred medical debt. That medical debt figure is a little smaller than the, the overall figure, but still, about one in four Americans um, has <coughs> medical debt bills they're paying off over time. That's from 2010 data. There have been some data from the California Health uh, sur Interview Survey. And we had a colleague yesterday, Shane, who said there's going to be some new data coming out. I think it, you know, 2000, 2009 data are going to be released soon. Um, but those data, these data here are from prior to, from before the, the, the recession, two and a half million residents in California had met that those that were paying off at the time. Uh, some of this is previously mentioned. The issue with medical debt, Medi people with medical debt, people with medical debt insurance, have care-seeking patterns that are very similar to the uninsured. The Kaiser Family Foundation's done some research um, on um, medical debt. And uh, medical debt in and of itself is a risk factor, as was mentioned previously. When we're kind of dealing with this health wealth cycle, people with low wealth, low income, have greater health problems, which do reinforce 
um, issues related to, to poverty and, and income. So these are some data in terms of people with medical debt and um, their, their access of health care. Again, this kind of cycle that we see, health, poor health can lead to issues of debt which contribute to poor health. You can venture this from not having enough financial resources to, uh, to have a healthy uh, living. The place matters. I, I, love, I love that, that name um, for the work because it, it clearly does. Um, but we're seeing this cycle of medical debt contributing to, to wealth problems and uh, exacerbating uh, health problems. Um, so some of the financial difficulties that people experience with medical debt. They're unable to pay basic expenses. Um, about 40% of the people with medical debt deplete their savings. That second bullet there should actually be 29 million Americans use up savings to pay their medical bills. Um, we're seeing similar trends in California in terms of the way medical debt first eats people's short-term savings. Um, but it goes beyond that, and uh, as was mentioned, for many people uh, like roll medical bills into home mortgages and have been put at risk, um, to their homes have been put at risk as a result of that. And many people enter into risky financial arrangements, trying to pay off these medical bills that they have, uh, putting things on credit cards, taking on payday loans, etc., trying to pay uh, medical bills that they have. Um, I want to spend some time talking about the issues related to uh, medical bills in the, in the credit report and, and in, the, in the credit area. And, and Elite is going to be speaking um, after me about um, some of the, the health issues um, in the Affordable Care Act and how <clears throat> the Affordable Care Act will address uh, some, of, some of the medical debt concerns. Um, again, from Commonwealth data, about 30 million Americans had uh, were contacted by collection agencies for medical bills that they had. And a study that was published in the Federal Reserve Bulletin found that half of, of accounts on credit reports that were in collection were medical in nature. Once a bill is sent to collection in, on a credit report, it's actually quite difficult to, to get it removed from the credit report. It doesn't really matter why it was sent to collection and um, and I'm sure that some of you in the room today have had experiences with health insurance where there's been some confusion around bills, um, uncertainty as to whether or not you're supposed to pay it. Um, and if there's too long a delay on that, oftentimes it, it, it ends up down a path that it's difficult to retrieve that bill from. But it's sent to collection. Once it's sent to collection, it's reported to the, to the credit bureaus. And once that happens, um, other problems resolve terms of uh, one's credit. These accounts are considered accounts in the so they're derogatory accounts. They go into the credit history section of the credit report, which is the most heavily weighted section of the credit report, and drive them to this credit source. When that happens, it increases the cost of any loan that one is going to access, whether it's an automobile loan, an interest rate you pay on a credit card, a home mortgage. That the examples here are from some articles that were written in the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times um, of people who had very small medical bills that created disproportionately large problems for them. Um, and these, these um, stories here are about people who have difficulties accessing affordable mortgages because of pretty small balanced medical bills that they have. In fact, once a medical bill ends up on a credit report, um, it stays there even if the balance due is zero. And the more recent that account is, even, even with a zero, balance due, the more recent that account is, the more heavily it's weighed uh, on a credit score. So you can have people with, um, who, who've had some you know, confusion around medical bills, small bills, copayments, 15, 20, 50 dollar bills, three or four of them, whose scores will be decreased by 100 points um, because they appear on a credit report, because they're considered derogatory accounts in this credit history section. Um, again, you know, some people borrow against their homes 
Um, some people struggle to maintain their mortgages. The, the top bullet here is from the, the National Foreclosure Litigation Counseling Program that served, I think, over a million people at this point in time over the past couple of years as we struggled with this foreclosure crisis. But I thought this was really interesting because 6% of the people served by that program cited medical debt, medical issues, as the primary reason for their mortgage default. And that actually was greater than the number of people whose rates were resetting and the interest rates on their mortgages were increasing. Um, obviously, this is a problem that's been largely driven by people's loss of jobs, reduction in income. But the third greatest uh, factor was uh, medical debt. I just, uh, again, want to spend some time looking at the uh, burden of health care costs um, by income category. And you see here that nearly half of people uh, at or below 133% of poverty uh, spent more than 10% of, of their household income on premiums and out-of-pocket costs. Uh, though the number is much less among higher income populations, it's still pretty dramatic, one in five individuals. Fortunately, the Affordable Care Act is going to, for those people under 133% of poverty, expand Medicaid, get rid of categorical eligibility for Medicaid so that people with uh, incomes below that figure will qualify for Medicaid. People between 133 and 400% of poverty are going to be eligible for subsidies for private health insurance. That will relieve some of the pressure. And I think for many of the people over 400% of poverty have substandard insurance right now, policies that um, don't adequately cover them for the medical expenses they have, there will be some changes to, to those policies as well under the Affordable Care Act. But I want to talk about, uh, briefly, Lee's going to speak uh, uh, in more detail about the Affordable Care Act, so I won't spend any time on that. Uh, I want to talk about a couple of provisions, that I, or one provision in the Affordable Care Act that I think is going to be crucially important going forward and an opportunity to really address medical debt. Um, and that is charity care standards and transparency around charity. There are some provisions, especially for nonprofit hospitals in the Affordable Care Act, that they have clear and transparent policies around charity care. That they reduce the fees that they charge the insured uh, for the services that they receive. That they not pursue aggressive collection actions against uh, uninsured people and people struggling financially. Um, there's also a provision in there that I think will be of interest to, to the public health people um, that requires hospitals to do regular community needs assessments. And again, I think this is an opportunity to bring together health and wealth in, in the hospitals, uh, in these nonprofit hospitals and the needs assessments. And I'm sure they'll be partnering with public health departments um, across the country to do this. But the way that medical bills are treated, the way the collection actions uh, taken to, to get payment from people for the medical debt that they have is going to be very important. I think there are examples out there, and there are examples in this state of systems that have very good charity care policies in place. It's going to be important to, to do the education to inform people of those policies so that people aren't billed for services um, and aggressive collection actions not taken against them. Um, that hopefully will reduce the amount that we expect to repay for the services they receive, and it won't put them in that spiral on, uh, in terms of their credit um, going forward. Just, I, I know I'm, I'm, I'm out of time, but I just want to say that there have been uh, actions at, at the state level and other states around the reporting of medical bills um, and, and issues related to um, credit for health care um, bills. And, there's a bill that's been introduced in Congress, H.R. 2086, the Medical Care Responsibility Act, that would do something that's pretty straightforward, pretty, seems a reasonable proposal. It would require that uh, medical debt, medical collection accounts that have a zero balance due be removed from a report within 45 days. So this only requires the removal of those accounts that have been fully paid or fully settled. Um, so I'd encourage you all to take a look at that. I think that these are a couple of provisions that would be uh, enormously helpful to people struggling with medical bills. It could make a real difference in terms of uh, people's lives uh, on this health wealth continuum. And uh, I will end there and turn this over to Leaf, and he's going to cover more details around issues related to the Affordable Care Act. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Pleasure to be here today, and um, 
it's especially a pleasure to see out there in the audience a number of friends and colleagues who are active in uh, health care reform back to the year of health care reform in California and then the passage of the Affordable Care Act, um, uh, you know, with the twists and turns that that took in, in March of last year. And um, as I was reflecting on that and realizing that, that now that I'm on the panel with a photojournalist, um, you realize very much that uh, in photojournalism and photography that how you see a photo depends a lot on the frame and where it's taken and how it's presented. And in the same way, probably the impact of and the desirability of the Affordable Care Act is very much in the eye of the beholder. Um, contrary to the hopes of many who worked to pass the bill, some of in this room, um, health care reform has really remained something of a Rorschach test. So while you either like it or you hate it, the bulk of media attention is focused on repeal and provisions that maybe aren't even in the bill, like death panels, rather than the practical consequences of implementation. Um, misconceptions abound. Even of the Americans who know that the bill was passed, 25% of them think it's already been repealed. And, and polls show that 30 to 40% of low-income folks in California think the bill will do them more harm than good. And so for a few minutes today, I want to leave the world of ideology and myth and um, return to the facts on the ground. I'm going to try to convince you that the ACA can be a bridge between folks who concentrate on health care and health policy and those who work principally on poverty and financial security and social welfare issues. And I'd argue that taken as a whole, the ACA should greatly improve the financial security of low and middle income Californians. It'll equalize access to affordable health coverage. It'll make it easier to avoid the medical debt issues that Mark's just laid out. Um, it'll lower the hassle of avoiding of enrolling either in public programs or in private coverage. And it'll give, um, very importantly, and I'll get to this at the end, uh, individuals at least some preliminary tools to try to reverse health care disparities in their own communities. And let's look um, for a minute at just a couple of slides about why the ACA was needed. If you see here, it's a comparative international study done by the Commonwealth Fund in New York. Essentially, even high-income folks in the U.S. Um, went because of medical care, uh, without medical care because of income, at a rate pretty much to even low-income people in other countries. And for low-income folks in this country, the figure is pretty staggering. Similarly, if we hadn't had reform, the number of uninsured would have reached nearly 70 million. Employer health spending could have gone up as much as 100%. And uncompensated care, the care that hospitals or doctors give that they aren't paid for, and is paid for either by charity or not at all, would have grown again by as much as 75 to 120%. So just to think back as, as you, you know, as the debate over the Affordable Care Act goes on, it's worthwhile just stepping back a few minutes and thinking what the trajectory of health costs and insurance would have been otherwise. <coughs> and the heart of the ACA is, as you know, is expanding um, insurance coverage and improving the quality of this coverage. And it's also an issue of wealth preservation and financial security. We know from many comparative studies of the insured and uninsured that coverage results in better access to care, um, improved health status, lower out-of-pocket costs, and reduced uh, mortality. And this expansion of coverage that I'm going to focus on today is, is taking place through two main vehicles. One is changes in eligibility to Medicaid, which was, is historically the health care program, federal health care, and, and also state health care program for most, but not all, of low-income Americans. And secondly, offering a refundable tax credit for the purchase of private insurance on newly established health care markets, or so-called exchanges. When this process is complete, 32 million Americans are expected to gain coverage, between 4 and 5 million in California alone, and about, the, and about 30, uh, 16 million of those through Medicaid. And just to put that in perspective, that's basically the same number of seniors who enrolled in Medicare in the mid to late 1960s when it was enacted. So just that one portion bill alone should lead to that increase in coverage. And to accomplish this, uh, other changes were made, and that's what this uh, sort of celestial navigation slide shows, some um, uh, to transform the market for health insurance, um, and down the line, hopefully, to change the way we deliver medical care. The most important features are the individual mandate, which requires the purchase of health coverage by adults who have the means to do so, 
and a variety of pilot programs aimed at strengthening primary care and reducing um, excess spending on medical treatments. And so I've titled this side, Medicaid is Health Insurance. And the reason I say that is because for many, many years, Medicaid or Medi-Cal in California was filled with categorical eligibility requirements. You couldn't be just a working adult man, for instance, and get access to Medicaid even if you were poor. You'd have to be, have all sorts of, you'd have to have dependent children or you'd have to be blind. One thing the Affordable Care Act does that's critically important, it makes Medicaid health insurance for anybody who makes 133% of poverty, practically speaking 138% of poverty or below. And that's a remarkable difference in the way things are treated. There'll be no more asset tests, for instance, for adults in Medi-Cal in California. And 1.7 million low-income Californians are expected to gain coverage um, as a result of this change in the welfare routes. There's also uh, something that's really unique to California. There's a federal waiver of Medicaid rules that could bring the state as much as $10 billion. Uh, California is the only state to get a waiver of this kind. And as many as 500,000 low-income Californians in 57 out of 58 counties, and you can ask a question about the 58 if you like, will be eligible either to continue their current coverage or to become newly enrolled. And public hospitals will have an opportunity to revamp their operations so that they might be a provider of choice and become places that individuals with either public or commercial coverage will seek out. And so, you know, so far so good with this. But here's the problem that most of you know. Um, Medi-Cal already was the target of $1.7 billion in cuts in the most recent state budget. There's really little or no low-hanging fruit in this program. We already have the lowest per capita Medicaid costs and among the lowest payments to providers. Um, and although the state intends to move most of those eligible for Medicaid into managed care in order to save money, there's really no conclusive evidence, only a hope that it'll do so. And budget cuts in Sacramento, if they're given the green light by the federal government, would um, put caps on the annual number of doctor visits, 10% payments to the already low provider payments, 10% cuts, and co-payments would be unprecedented in the program for emergency room visits and others. And this is on top of the elimination of adult dental care and other services that are already having a pretty, pretty ugly impact. So there's concern here, even as the Affordable Care Act gets implemented, um, in 2014 and after, that the brakes are being applied even as we try to push on the accelerator to get better coverage. And then if you can see the bottom line of the slide, that leads to the next one, which is that even after the Affordable Care Act is in, is in place, there'll still be over a million Californians, most of them immigrants without legal status, who won't be covered. And so one other critical feature of the Affordable Care Act anticipating this is about $11 billion in funding for federally qualified health centers, um, many of which, of course, as you know, operate here in the East Bay and the Oakland area, such as La Clinica. And three quarters of all visits to those clinics are made by people of color or the uninsured who are treated um, principally by counties. Unfortunately, again, there's some federal budget cuts that are actually taking away some of that money or offsetting the money even as it's coming down the pipe. And so the third and, and, and very important um, way that coverage is being expanded is through exchanges. And these are basically um, stores for insurance, a place where you can go and compare coverage. There are already uh, some of these things up and running in Massachusetts quite comprehensively, in Utah, which is more like an Expedia information comparison site for healthcare. But what are these? They're gonna offer subsidies in a sliding scale up to folks with 400% of the poverty level, so about 88,000 for a family of four. And it'll, the gradually the subsidy will phase out as you get closer to the top end. Um, it's politically quite critical to reform and also for getting people involved in coverage. And one of the things that's really important here is that California was the very first state in the country to set up an exchange after the passage of the Affordable Care Act. Um, it's actually two exchanges, one's located to small businesses and other individuals. Um, and this will be the only place that individuals and small businesses will be able to get access to these subsidies. But it still raises a lot of questions, and the big ones are these. Um, if, you know, it's the field of dreams question. If you build it, will people come? Will people come? Will there be enough of them so that insurers will actually offer products at reasonable rates? Um, will the products be standardized so you can actually know how to choose between them? 
and what will the minimum benefits be, which will also make a pretty big difference. One other thing that the AC offers, which you may have heard about, which was the subject of a big debate in Sacramento in the last session, is a uh, the basic health program, in which and instead of having, or in addition to having an exchange, the money that would go for folks from 133 to 200% of poverty would go to the creation of this new program. And there's some possible advantages of this. For instance, one would be the continuity of coverage. If you were from 133 to 200% of poverty, you'd probably be less likely to leave your current provider network. And it might lead, although not necessarily, to lower spending by the state. However, it could leave the exchange without enough people in it to make it work, and also lead to higher prices for insurance products for people on the exchange. So that was a bill that went forward, um, sponsored by the uh, chairman of the Senate Health Committee. Uh, it's a two-year bill, though, maybe back next year. It didn't pass this year. It'd be, I'd have to talk about it a little more uh, in Q&A. And I'm going to conclude by looking at a couple of other key features of the ACA. And one of the, these are ones that I think are really crucial to both those interested in health policy and in financial services and economic development as well. Um, the ACA directs the exchanges to determine eligibility to public programs for anybody who enters, so it actually acts as a new way of steering people to public programs that they're eligible for. And a bill that's actually on the governor's desk right now sets a very critical framework for the ACA by establishing a single standard application form for Medi-Cal, for healthy families, for the exchange, and for county programs. So this is something, as you know, as you know streamlining the process by which folks become eligible is very important for health care. And it also could lead to parallel opportunities, I'd argue, in other areas of social service provision. And finally, um, as we've heard from Carmen Navarez and, and um, our partners sponsoring this panel, um, everyone who works in public health and, and many of both, not most of those who work in health care generally knows it's the circumstances in which people work and live and play, um, not really access to high-tech medicine or or acute medical care that determines for the most part whether people are healthy. Land use, availability of good food, jobs that minimize stress, these are all part of the key social determinants of health. And there's also growing evidence that financial security itself is an important contributor to good health, as we've heard. And the Affordable Care Act recognizes this and offers a bit of an entering wedge uh, by putting forward and incorporating a number of relatively small and potentially important programs um, that could encourage the, the, um, the, the um, lessening of these, uh, the improvement of social determinants of health. One is the prevention of public health funds. Um, we've always already spent $42 million of that in California and $750 million nationally. Although the President's plan for debt reduction would cut it in half, the requirements for chain restaurants and vendors to disclose nutritional content and finally, I, um, the Public Health Institute, as, as you heard from Mark, has received one of these terrific community transformation grants intended to reduce ethnic and racial disparities, and they're going to be operating in 42 counties in California. Um, so a terrific practical consequence of the Affordable Health, Health Act. Um, and so in conclusion, um, all these elements of the Affordable Care Act uh, that ostensibly are directed you know, mostly in health and health care policy, as we've seen, also should have a big impact on the asset building community and those of you who are working in financial services. So perhaps down the road when we've taken that picture and it's fully developed, the Affordable Care Act could be genuinely the missing link. Either that or a nod to our plastic surgeons. <laughs> Thank you so much. Can you all hear me? Perfect. Thank you for that, Leif. Um, again, Olivia Calderon, and, uh, and I think uh, Mark and Leif uh, did a great job of, uh, of showing the research and the data, again, that help link this health wealth conversation. Um, we know that Californians, Mark showed data that says 2 million are struggling with medical debt, and even with the passage of the Affordable Care Act, because many of these Californians have health insurance, even with the passage of the Affordable Care Act, it's going to insure about 5 million Californians 
Uh, our residents are still going to have to deal with out-of-pocket costs and figure out a way to pay for those out-of-pocket costs, which is why we need to be advancing policies and initiatives that help Californians build savings and assets over their lifetime which is why, together with our health program and partners in Sacramento, we started to advance this health wealth legislative agenda, and you have it there in your packets. This year, we worked on 11 bills. Six of these bills are currently on the governor's desk. All of them passed out of the legislature um, in the uh, middle of uh, September, and the governor has until October the 9th to sign many of these bills into law. I want to be very, very clear when I discuss what these initiatives are that we do not believe that any one of these bills will in and of itself solve poverty or help people permanently exit poverty. Um, many of these um, efforts are also been incremental because we've had to be very sensitive to the fact that there is no money at the state level. And, uh, and for our state lawmakers and for the governor, are very sensitive about cost, but believe that these efforts do lay the foundation and the framework for us to be visionary and to continue to move forward in a bipartisan way uh, to, uh, to help financially empower uh, working families in our state. And so um, what we were able to do is, uh, is think about, okay, what are the key opportunities within the ACA, within the Affordable Care Act, uh, that allow for us to make this clear connection. And so one of um, Leaf mentioned um, that uh, we're able to now kind of streamline the eligibility for various state programs, health programs, um, and, uh, and uh, other uh, means-tested programs. And so uh, together with Wealth, uh, Western Center on Law and Poverty, the California Welfare Directors Association, Health Access, um, and Food Policy Advocates, uh, we're able to advance efforts to uh, do what AB6 does, um, which will um, help streamline eligibility for it, our uh, state's um, food stamp and welfare to work program, CalFresh and, uh, and CalWorks. It eliminates the fingerprinting imaging in, in, in these uh, programs, um, as well as deals with semi-annual reporting. Um, in addition to that, um, the Welfare Directors Association and Health Access also sponsored legislation um, to, uh, to create an office of a patient advocate. There's going to be a lot of information out there, and Californians are going to have to figure out how to maneuver through it. And so this office of patient advocate is going to be housed in the Health and Human Services Agency to provide Californians with, with accurate, up-to-date information on, um, on health insurance. Um, and, uh, and in addition to that, the Health and Human Agency, uh, Health and Human Services Agency, has been directed to collaborate with all the various departments um, to figure out how we've said with the Assemblywoman Bonilla Bill 1296, um, streamline algebra, uh, the application process for all the various um, state programs out there. We know that Californians are in great need and they need to have access to these various uh, services. Um, I know that um, many of you heard the news uh, when the census reported that about 6 million Californians are now living in poverty. Um, it's really, it was reporting on income poverty. And we believe that income poverty is just the tip of the iceberg. What we should really be thinking about is asset poverty. About 30% of our state residents are living in asset poverty, meaning they don't have enough savings, enough assets, to be able to survive at the poverty level for three months if they were to experience a medical emergency or lose their job or have already lost their job. Uh, and so uh, we, want, we, we need to ensure, I mean, the safety net was created for these difficult times, that folks are able to apply in a very, very easy way and create this one e-app so that folks can be able to tap into all the various resources that are available out there for them uh, to provide this temporary assistance. Um, and so when I talk about these struggling families, the most indigent among us, we know that the CalWORKs program, the Welfare to Work program, was created uh, to help folks transition back into the workforce, provide temporary assistance. And so there's another piece of legislation that's before the governor's desk. Um, this is uh, a bill that would eliminate the vehicle asset test in our CalWORKs program. It eliminates the vehicle test. There's a limit. You can't have more than $4,650 worth of a car. Uh, and if your car's worth more than 4650 bucks, then you're ineligible for CalWORKs. Um, and we think that that's really silly, uh, especially in a state like California and in areas like in rural California, where you need to have a car to get to and from work. Uh, and, uh, and so this bill actually moved through the legislature with bipartisan support, which is an incredible victory in and of itself, because the car has been such a contentious issue in our welfare programs. And so uh, a lot of Republicans in rural districts, like I mentioned, stepped up and supported this effort to eliminate the vehicle asset test in CalWORKs. 
So now it's before the governor's desk. Um, and, uh, and we're hopeful that he'll sign it because what we were able to find is that really it's just keeping less than one-tenth of one percent of people out of the program. That folks that are applying for assistance, um, their car's not worth more than this amount. And our county workers are having to have to go through Kelly Blue Book to have to determine the value of someone's car, which is such a waste of administrative dollars. And that's money that they could be otherwise uh, spending helping to get people back to work um, as opposed to looking at these silly rules. Um, then there were the very um, traditional asset building efforts that our partners um, in the in the health um, community stepped up and helped support us. Um, one specifically is banking development districts and the department here, um, Alameda County, is, has been a visionary leader and incredibly supportive of these efforts. We, uh, in 2008, helped Governor Schwarzenegger start Bank on California which really started in San Francisco around 2006. Um, it was a city effort to help the unbanked and underbanked um, our residents there in San Francisco that didn't have a basic savings, a basic checking account, and without one, it's impossible for you to begin to build your savings, to, uh, to challenge banks to, to develop these starter accounts, low-cost accounts for folks to, to enter the financial mainstream. It started in 2006 in San Francisco, and it was so wildly successful um, that, uh, that the state of California stepped up under the leadership of Governor Schwarzenegger and launched the statewide um, Bank On program to, uh, to help um, the city of San Francisco really share its learnings and its practices with other cities. And about six mayors uh, launched uh, similar initiatives in cities throughout the state of California. This program is now being replicated in about five states, 70 cities across the country. Um, but the reason it works really well is because there are existing banks and credit unions to partner with. But in communities and in areas where there are no banks, where all you see are check cashers and payday lenders, we're not going to be able to spur bank on initiatives. And so AB 38, the Banking Development District Program, we believe should be incorporated into this bank on statewide effort. Um, what it would do initially, and this is before the governor as well, um, is it would require the Department of Financial Institutions to look out into the state basically and map it out. Um, and identify where are these communities, where are these cities that don't have these um, financial institutions that are necessary for all these very issues, not only to develop starter accounts, but also um, provide the credit that folks need to, to start their businesses, um, to provide home loans and so forth, and to just invest in the community. The visceral impact of having an actual bank, um, and many of these banks that have been participating in banking development district programs like in the state of California, uh, New York, are community banks, are small and mid-sized banks. They care about investing and being in the community. Um, to, uh, to be able to identify where are these communities and then provide the legislators with the roadmap of, uh, of where these targeted incentives should be to help these banks um, develop and, and open up in these areas. And so um, the initial step is going to be mapping, and after that it's going to be requiring that the state treasurer work with the Department of Financial Institutions to provide state deposits um, to these uh, banks and credit unions that agree to open up in these communities and then develop the products and services that are tailored to the needs of low-income consumers. Finally, one of our major state partners has been Controller John Chung. Um, he has had a time after, year after year, he's had financial service fairs um, in, um, in, in the Capitol Park. Um, this year we joined him again for, for the financial service fair that he, that he provided. He uh, wants to be able to um, have an advocate within the office of the controller that would be there to work in partnership with banks throughout the state, um, nonprofits um, that are interested in consumer financial education and lift up and highlight those successful uh, finan consumer financial programs that are taking place throughout the state. And so he, the, the bill that you see there before you would create a... Um, uh, cons a consumer financial education fund in the office of the treasurer and would allow the controller of the state then to manage those funds to be able to first and foremost uh, create a state website that would be like a clearinghouse for all the various financial education efforts that are happening throughout the state and make it easy for Californians to maneuver through. You could put something as simple as your zip code in there and you could you know, be searching for how do I, how do I go about getting a car loan or, or I'm thinking about buying a house, where can I start to get some counseling and, or you know, I need to fix my credit because there's this medical bill that I paid and it's still showing up on my credit report and it's making everything difficult for me. Um, uh, I'm thinking about going to college for the first time. How do I go about financing my college education? 
um, that you will be able to go to this clearinghouse. Um, and, and we've been working with the controller to develop something even more visionary than that. What about if we had a financial service core, a core of financial um, uh, counselors, volunteers that would go out there um, to help low-income consumers and really volunteer their time to help people do the most basic things, like developing a budget. Um, to, uh, to thinking about, again, planning for their retirement and, their, and, and developing a nest egg. Um, so that's what the controller's doing. Um, but I, I do want to say that, again, um, these are incremental approaches. We, of course, um, believe in more visionary ideas. We, we know that the need out there is, is great. And many times when we're working with our partners, feel like it's just it's, it's daunting when we think about how our families are struggling. Um, uh, Carmen had mentioned, and Anita mentioned, the unemployment rate in our state. We know that in communities of color, I see on price here from the Insight Center um, that, uh, that the, the wealth disparities are even greater in, in communities of color. And we need to have, you know, uh, our approaches should be universal. Uh, they should be targeted to meet the needs of, of communities of color. Uh, and we can't do this work alone, which is why I'm so thrilled that, uh, that this year the California EITC and Asset Building Coalition was launched. Um, we at the New America Foundation, along with five other partners, were founding members of this coalition. This coalition is going to be having its second annual symposium in Los Angeles on November 15th, so mark your calendars. Many of these policies will be highlighted at this symposium down in Los Angeles. Uh, last year, the First Lady, Maria Shriver, was our keynote and challenged us to continue to work together and break out of our silos because the need of a family is in siloed and our field shouldn't be siloed either. We should all be working together to advance our mutual endeavors. And so with that, I'm going to pass the mic on to Arnie because uh, one of the reasons why we've decided to go on the road and host these speaker series throughout the state of California is because whenever we're in communities and we hear the real life impact that the work has on, uh, on struggling Californians, it helps to, um, to put a face on a lot of the work that we're doing in Sacramento, and, it, and it's powerful in and of itself. So with that, Arnie. So what I'd like to talk about this morning with South Men is the contact that I have with folks at uh, medical clinics in Oakland and in Alameda, and with what they're dealing with in terms of death and how this is affecting their lives and how it prevents them from getting the medical care that they really desperately need. And in some cases, it's actually shortening their lives and the lives of their children. So let me give you a couple concrete examples of folks I've been dealing with. There's a couple from Italy, uh, first generation immigrants, about 75 years old, who have a $10,000 CD. Because of that CD, they don't qualify for Medi-Cal, yet they, they both, both uh, members of the family have major medical issues, and what they've said is, we want to give this money to our heirs, we're not gonna spend it down, and they in fact now are not taking their medications, not getting their medical treatment. This has to change. Another family that I'm working with has a $900 share of costs but they have Medi-Cal. So Medi-Cal in that particular case isn't really helping them because they have to spend $900 every month in order to get Medi-Cal to kick in beyond that. So they're trapped in this situation where Medi-Cal exists, it's there, they participate in it, but it doesn't pay. So now they're having to go out and buy supplementary insurance, either HMO, EPO, something of that sort, to actually fill the gap that Medi-Cal is not filling. I've also got another single person who has probably $500 worth of bills from ambulance trips and medical treatments that he did not know was on his credit report when he went to get an apartment. He couldn't get one because he has negative credit rating. He went to get employment, could not get employment for the same reason. Employers now are checking credit reports, credit history, before they will actually offer a job. If they have two people equal qualifications, one with stellar credit, one with less than stellar credit, 
guess who gets the job? And so it goes throughout society and goes beyond just the medical issue. It goes to the issue of being able to actually have a livable wage. Things that are changing, in at least one case, not for the better, is in Alameda County in terms of health insurance. And this is going to affect a lot of folks who don't qualify for Medi-Cal, who can't afford things like Secure Horizons or Health Net or Kaiser. Anthem Blue Cross has been kind of a savior in many cases in Alameda County. because They've offered a zero premium policy. That policy covered with no deductible things like emergency room and primary care physician visits. There is a deductible of $300 for other services. That premium is now going from zero to $131. So the folks that were banking on that kind of policy are going to go have to go shopping. And what you're going to find is that there's nothing less basically than about $75 a month. That $75 a month for many of these folks is the difference between living and existing. It's the difference between having food on the table, being able to get transportation, and many other items. This also has to change because these folks are now getting depressed. They are now needing mental health services, and it just mushrooms. It then affects the entire family, not just those that need the medical care. Another big issue is the whole process of application, which was mentioned before. For people to understand what opportunities there are for help, what help there is out there in terms of uh, support for pharmaceuticals, for uh, doctor's visits, and so on, most people don't even have an idea as to what exists, or how to apply for it, or what the qualifications are. And if you look at the Medi-Cal application, for example, uh, it's about four pages long, the basic application, and then there are about six additional forms that have to be filled out before it can even be considered for Medi-Cal. These things also are roadblocks for people to get any kind of supportive medical help. Also, in-home services or in-home support services are tied to Medi-Cal. Uh, I've got another uh, client who is in a wheelchair, who doesn't have the ability to cook, but because she has a stove and a refrigerator, her funds are cut because it's assumed she can cook because she has that facility. Again, it's these kinds of people who are suffering because of the way the system is set up. Many people don't know that there's something called LIS, or Low Income Subsidy, for medications administered by the Social Security Administration. It actually drops the cost of their medication to about $1.10 for generics and $3.30 for brand names. If you don't know about it, you can't apply for it, you don't have the help. There are other programs such as that where, again, there isn't the knowledge and the counseling for these folks to understand what, they're, what they have available. The pharmaceutical industry itself has patient assistance programs. But again, most of the population either doesn't know they exist, don't know the rules, and they don't know how to access that, uh, that benefit. So that ties in, in to the wealth side, the asset building side, in that these folks that are really medically indigenous, medically very poor, can't, they don't have the money to create an account. In the financial counseling that I'm doing, I started with you know, save a dollar, save a dollar a week, save five dollars a week, save something, start the plan, start doing budgeting so that you can see where you're going in terms of having emergency money for medical expenses or for whatever comes up. 
So it's really kind of eye-opening for me as a counselor, both from a financial side and a Medicare and Medi-Cal side, to deal with these folks that have major medical issues, no funds, and extremely limited access to care. And so, again, I think that this has to change and change fairly quickly, or we're going to have a large segment of the population that's going to suffer both in terms of living and then a shorter lifespan. So thank you very much. very, very well thought out and detailed presentations. actually has a law, a state law passed in 2006, that goes beyond the Affordable Care Act in terms of protections for uninsured and low-income hospital patients. And it's one of those programs that people don't know about. There are flyers, bilingual flyers, on the table, and there's a website where we're trying to get information out. But um, the Hospital Fair Pricing Act of 2006 in California says that if you're uninsured and at 350% of the federal poverty level or below, that a hospital cannot charge you more than they could get from Medi-Cal or Medicare for hospital care, which ends up to be a discount of at least two-thirds and usually around 75%. It doesn't mean free care, um, but it also protects people from being sent to collections while they are applying for the discount or trying in good faith to come up with a payment plan, and it says that the payment plan has to be reasonable, quote unquote. So if a hospital is trying to get a low-income person to pay $400 a month, that person, as long as they're applying or have agreed on a principle, has in, in principle the right to continue to negotiate until the hospital comes up with an amount that is actually sustainable for them. So it's a huge, um, uh, the law has a tremendous amount of power, but we've got to get it out there. People just don't know about it. Um, so I hope that you will take the posters, flyers, put them up in bulletin boards if you work with people who are uninsured. Technically, it's supposed to help people who are underinsured, as in spend more than 10% of their income on health care. It is much harder to get hospitals to do anything about that. Advocacy is still needed. And many hospitals actually offer the discount to people above 350%. For example, Tenet and Sutter um, typically go to four and 500%, and there are some hospitals that go up to 1,000% of the federal poverty level. So, thank you. Thank you. Can I respond to Jessica's question? <laughs> <laughs> um, thanks, Jessica, that's great. Leaf said Medicaid is, is health insurance. It's also, also wealth protection. And I just want to kind of invite the people doing work on the wealth, uh, on, the, on the asset building side, into the health discussion and implementation process. It's, it's going to be very important. And I think that um, the issues related to streamlining the eligibility and enrollment is going to be crucial. And the uh, wisdom of those in the asset field, in the public health field, and I think of the asset field as kind of the foundation of public health work. Um, it's, it's going to be very important to, to, to um, insert that wisdom into the process of implementing the Affordable Care Act. And your example just now of this Pricing Act is is, is perfect uh, perfect example of, of protections that exist that too few people are aware of. And I think there's a real opportunity to knit together these various safety net programs, what Jessica's raised and what Arnie talked about, some of the programs Arnie talked about, and make sure that they're all part of that uh, package that's going to be screened. People will be screened for eligibility for those programs and to streamline the enrollment and into those programs as much as possible. I think that's going to be 
very important going forward. Quick, um, quick follow-up to Jessica. Um, relative of mine was discharged from the emergency room at Alton Bates at Southern Hospital, and um, they actually received notification of the. Is that a requirement under the law that they need to receive that notification or not? It, it is, is a, a requirement, um, and Sutter does very well at it, as was tenant, because they got sued for uh -huh. overcharging on insured patients, okay. which is how we got money to do this project. Most hospitals in California are doing a very bad job. Um, and we actually, uh, so there is an, on the website a file a complaint button and anytime anybody who is uninsured is billed by a hospital and has not been notified about this, um, send them to the website and the first thing they should do is a file a complaint about non-compliance. Thank you very much. I want to just ask that if you're going to speak that you have the microphone in your hand because we are trying to record this, okay? So we have another question over here. Hi, uh, Michael Weinberg. I run healthcare for a group called the Bay Area Council um, and uh, former colleague of uh, Lee and Olivia. It's great to see you guys. What a wonderful presentation. Um, so much information, but then uh, Arnie, your uh, presentation really grounded it in the reality of uh, you know people's experience. Um, so what I wanted to, to have you guys uh, address a little bit is the issue of complexity, right? There's a bit of a catch-22 in a lot of these situations where we want to pass some law that helps some people do something, right? We want a law that will help underinsured people with their hot health bills and so on and so forth. And all those sort of laws are inherently valuable, but we create a system in which there are a thousand different programs that you may or may not apply, uh, qualify for, and that ultimately complexity favors the powerful because the powerful have lawyers and financial planners and you know think tanks to think through this for them. But complexity. Um, is really difficult for people with limited means. And so I just wanted, and this is, is true in the uh, sort of asset sector as it is in the health sector, we create these enormously complex systems. So how do you wrestle with trying to kind of, you know, put band-aids on a very complex system versus try to create, you know, systems that really maybe work, uh, you know, in a more simple and, and equitable way? Well, legislatively, my on, can you hear me? My mic on? Yes. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's right, Michael. I think um, we've tried to legislatively figure out how do we help low-income Californians, middle-income Californians maneuver through um, the ACA as well as the other health programs and uh, state benefits that they might be eligible for. And so AB 1296, the Bonilla bill that Leaf mentioned, um, helps to, again, to streamline this effort and also the legislation that creates this office of uh, the patient advocate. Um, that, uh, that will help to, uh, to house all these various programs in a single place um, and, then, uh, and then partner with all the various uh, organizations out there to, to help to um, get this information to the communities. But it also helps to reinforce why we're having these conversations throughout the state and these public forums is that they're going to have to, partners in the community are going to have to know about this and they're the ones that are working on the ground with folks that have community trust, that have all the various partnerships and they're going to have to go out there as well um, and get the information out to folks and let them know um, existing programs that, that, that are in place now and help folks to take advantage of that. But Lee, you we were asked a similar question in Los Angeles. I just want to follow um, up on that. Yes, I, I think that the general philosophy, then to give some specific examples, the general philosophy is, of course, the no wrong door approach. That basically wherever you enter the system, even if you're not aware, you end up being moved to the right place for you. And I, and I think the both in the Affordable Care Act and in the Companion Bill in California, you're seeing evidence of understanding of this sort of issue so that you can be taken to the right place even if you don't know, you know, the, the right, you know, the right access going in. But there's a lot of real life examples um, of this. One was in the Massachusetts Exchange, the so-called connector. They started out in the unsubsidized portion of the connector having many, many different plans, all of which differed from each other only by a little bit, and they've been encouraged to do that by, you know, folks in the health policy world who wanted people to have, you know, precise choices and options. I mean, and you'll see this, of course, in Social Security privatization debate. There are a lot of people, and they're, you know, well-meaning people who really feel that choice is the principal value. And then when this Massachusetts plan was put into effect after about two years, it was quickly realized that people didn't actually want this choice, and the you know, the head of the connector said basically we're going to limit this, we're going to standardize it, limit it to three and people are a lot happier. Medicare drug benefit, same sort of thing. 
started out with lots of choices, and even if they were you know, tiny differences, I mean, narcissism is small differences, and now there are a lot of choices, but not nearly as many in this, as in the start. So basically, I wouldn't say, you know, it's, it's almost un-American to say that choice is a overvalued virtue, but um, in public programs, probably you want to have a few clear differences, differentials, and then go from there. Absolutely, and behavioral economists do show us, right, research that when you have all these options, you're probably not going to take advantage of any of them because it's just so complicated and convoluted, and you're just like, where do I even start? Which is why in the asset building field, we've been trying to figure out how do we simplify it? How do we make it easy? How do we make it automatic? How do we create like that very simple option um, so that folks will take advantage of all these various benefits that are out there? I think there are a couple of other examples in the Affordable Care Act, and one is Medicaid, the Medicaid program and making it simpler in terms of who qualifies for Medicaid, so basing that on income and not on a particular composition of family. And the other is, I think, uh, around uh, private health insurance. And, uh, and you know in California, because you have many problems, especially in the, in the non-group market here, um, uh, the, the, the rules of the game are gonna change dramatically for, for, under private insurance going forward. And I think many of the tricks and traps that are, are part of the private insurance market, in particular for, for non-group and small group insurance products, will be addressed uh, going forward. So there's some simplification, yet at the same time, you're right, there's going to be an array of programs, and I think that, um, um, I think technology can help, and I think it solves all problems, but I'm hopeful that with uh, the use of some of these web-based and, and uh, platforms to help uh, ease enrollment in the programs that we can address some of those challenges of complexity. There's something else that's going to be taking place too. In Alameda County, we're starting a Spark Point Center in Fremont. There's one in Oakland. And this is actually a center point for anybody coming in and seeking any kind of assistance, whether it's food stamps, uh, CalWORKs, whatever it is. It come, they come in really with a financial review, and then from there, they're filtered out to whatever agency will best serve their needs. Any other questions out here? I am uh, Stephen Watkins. I'm with the Mission Economic uh, Development Agency in San Francisco. And uh, I work on financial education. I, uh, I'm the, uh, the, the, the program leader, and I'm in the middle of trying to assess my options. And I, first of all, I guess the, <clears throat> just to back up a little bit, uh, I would underline what Olivia said about narrowing the field of choice. And in that spirit, what I'm faced with right now is narrowing the field of choice in terms of how do I train my staff uh, to, in what, what, what options are available for me in training my staff as financial educators and what, uh, the question specifically for you, Olivia, would be what, if anything, New America is doing to sort of standardize the field of community-based financial education. I mean, there's a lot of stuff out there. There's not a lot, uh, from what I can tell, that not a lot of it is actually applicable. It's not standardized. There are a lot of different places to choose from. But I was just wondering, I'd like to hear your thoughts on, so that we can address the health-wealth connection. What are your thoughts about sort of standardizing a, 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 a maybe, what I've, in, what I've envisioned is, is, is maybe a uh, professional, some professional standardization. Not making much sense right now, <laughs> but um, right. I hope you understand what I'm saying. Yeah, um, so I'm a huge fan of the Mission Economic Development Agency. I have to say I'm, I'm on the board, but I love Plaza Adelante. Right. And actually on October the 4th, the, uh, the Select Committee on Financial Empowerment, um, and you'll have, you have information of this committee in your packets. Uh, it's, the, it's the first committee in any state house at the state level it's focused specifically on wealth building and wealth preservation. It's a bipartisan committee, and it's made up of members from throughout the state of California. 
Uh, they had a hearing in Los Angeles. They're meeting in San Francisco and, uh, and are going to be visiting Plaza Adelante because it's such a fabulous model where it houses a bunch of nonprofits um, that are providing much needed services to the folks there in the Mission District. Um, but in terms of uh, financial education, uh, one of the things that we've been focused on in America is, uh, is trying to advance K-12 financial education. I um, think that we need to start from the beginning with our kids. Um, that when we look at what was happening prior to the foreclosure crisis, uh, Californians weren't sa saving. Americans were not saving. Um, we had the lowest savings rate than, than it was during the Great Depression. Right? It was all credit, credit, debt, debt. And that we need to have a cultural shift if we're going to actually have an impact. And we need to start with our kids, which is why we're so excited that the city of San Francisco um, has been a leader. That every single kindergartner in San Francisco is starting kindergarten with a college savings account that's opened by the city, that is uh, that's seated by the city, and it's progressive in that it helps low-income kids. It matches their savings. Um, and think that having models is great. A talent that's actually with you, that's growing with you, that's tangible, and that you're learning about money management in this very real way um, is a powerful way to have this kind of cultural shift again. But in terms of, of the community and, and having standards across the field, uh, there hasn't been any movement um, in, in, in that space um, in Sacramento. But again, um, the controller Jun Chung, as I mentioned, um, his efforts, he has to, of course, be very sensitive to cost. And I think that's what's been the challenge um, over the past half decade in Sacramento is that a lot of these ideas are visionary. And in order for us to be able to make a dent in a difference, we have to invest in these ideas and in these policies. And so there hasn't been the financial support there to do so. Um, but there are great um, models out there and templates that can be replicated. And the SF Earn in San Francisco, a nonprofit, they offer financial counseling. Um, they had at the beginning of the year training uh, for other nonprofit leaders to join them and, and go through um, uh, courses. Uh, and, uh, and, and we're also providing it um, for free for many of the nonprofit leaders. And so I'm happy to connect you with them after today's discussion. Opportunity Fund has also done so. Um, and so there are nonprofits out there that do have programs that work. The FDIC also has Money Smarts. Um, and you could go online and you can order Money Smarts. And it's, um, it's, it's creative age appropriate um, financial education. Oh, yeah. Well, it's from kids. It's like they have like, yeah, no, it's, it's for like children and also adults. And you can go online and they'll mail it to you for free. Um, you can get the CDs, you can get the material. Um, and so, and so there, there are programs out there. But you're right, there are so many options, right? Um, that you don't know where to start. But there haven't been that effort policy wise to try to create a statewide standard. I just want to mention the parallel or a bit of a cognate in the healthcare side. Um, one of the provisions of the ACA in respect to the, the health exchanges, the health markets, um, is the um, now that you say they're going to have to be navigators to help folks through the process. Now, who will actually educate the navigators, who the navigators will be, like former insurance brokers, others, is itself a kind of an endlessly you know, interesting question, but it is a little bit unusual that in a, a, you know, act of the scope that these specific you know, guidance counselors, as it were, are, are stipulated in the end. And I also want to say, I mean, financial education is one piece of it. But we also need to look at asset protection and look at the products that are out there, which is why when I was talking about this banking development district idea, when we're telling, you know, banks and credit unions, we'll, we'll deposit local deposits and state deposits into your institution. But you have to be a community partner, and you have to develop products and services that are tailored to the needs of consumers and not gouge low-income consumers with exorbitant fees. Those fees, it's money that they could be otherwise saving, but to make sure that our, you know, mortgages are not blowing up in our faces. Um, so that we also need to look at the product in and of itself. And, and, uh, and that there's a clear linkage between asset building and asset protection. And for our friends in the asset protection space, like the Center for Responsible Lending and the California Reinvestment Coalition and Consumers Union, they're working in that space to make sure that the financial products are not so complicated and convoluted. It doesn't matter if you really know, right? If you're educated and um, that you just don't know how to maneuver because it's just the product in and of itself is flawed. Um, like the payday product. We know the fees are 300, 400%. You take out this two week loan and then you get stuck in a debt trap. And the payday lender will say, but it's so easy. You come into my shop and look, the fees are right there. You know, it's, it's straightforward, no hidden fees. No, there, we know that people get stuck in a debt trap because when you're living paycheck to paycheck, two weeks later, you're not gonna have those 300 bucks to pay back. And I think as it relates to medical debt, it's really important that people not get into this risky financial uh, situations and, and, and take a problem and make it even worse after that through penalties and late fees and high interest rates. And I think that there are some protections in place. Hopefully there are others that can be implemented going forward 
And I think you know one of the takeaway messages hopefully today for, for everybody in the room was in particular working with individuals and on asset building and wealth protection is to really discourage people from from taking out credit card loans. I mean putting things on credit, medical expenses on credit cards or taking out a payday loan to pay off a health care provider because it's very likely that there are other protections in place and you know, you really need to do that. So we're getting to the end of our time and I want to invite the audience to come up and have maybe a little bit less formal conversation with our presenters who I think did an absolutely excellent job. One of the things that occurs to me in, in thinking about everything that's been said today is this going to be a tremendous challenge in really thinking through in a very thoughtful way how we distribute information about the kinds of, of, of solutions and options that you talked about today. And one thing that I didn't hear talked about that I want to just inject into the, into the conversation perhaps at some other point, um, we need to think about the fact that amongst poor people, poor people of color in this country, some of the fastest growth in cell phone use has happened in that sector. Now, people may not have individual personal computers in their homes, but they have a cell phone. And one of the things that we want to think about is how might we help people to access the kind of information and linkages that they might access through the cell phones, through the thing they already have in their pocket. People in other countries have already figured out how to do this. In Africa, people do all the things in their So, you know, we, we should be able to think this one through, and I think we have the kind of assets that we need to make those connections and linkages. But um, let me just say I learned a great deal. Thank you very much for the, uh, for the incredible support and leadership that the Alameda County Department of Public Health uh, had in helping to put this together along with the Urban Strategies Council. Thank you again. And also the New America Foundation. You guys did a great job. This was very, very, uh, very, very methoding. Um, thanks for connecting the dots. And I guess it just all goes to show that health is way more complicated than we even knew. <laughs> so thank you very much, everybody.